Hello and Shamai. Welcome to Activate Auditory Connections. I'm Emerald Grace. We're the podcast between technology and people, valuing people, data, and power in the drive towards global neuro inclusion. Subscribe for topical episodes, meditations, and lived experience stories. Shining a light on his lived experience, in this interview, I'm joined by ND consultant and keynote speaker, Matt Gupwell. Matt, hello. It's a pleasure to hello. have you. Hello. Thank How you. Nice you? to meet you. I'm really good. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm very good. Sat here in my own private theatre, just enjoying speaking to people. So yeah, I'm, I'm all it good. It is. Your red background, the curtains you've got are fantastic. I've got these coloured coloured post-it notes behind me, my... My my wall is behind me. I've got my, my classic gold frames on. I've got a golden rainbow necklace. And, you look uh, yeah, you're looking um, very very yeah. good. Now my, all my post-it notes and my ADHD the mess is in front of me off camera. So you know. Uh, we we flipped it. We've got a mirror mirror image. So I've put oh, all yeah. of my my chaos on the screen, and you've put the curtain <laughs> across. I like your scar style. So your your neurotypes are ADHD. You say. Uh, so ADHD, autism with PDA profile, and dyslexia. Okay, so you've been collecting them. You've been collecting the neurotypes. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll, we may talk about this, but um, kind of one followed the other, uh, followed the other as I, as I did my own research, my own self discovery, um, and and kind of came to my own acceptance of things as well. So, yeah. Um, this, uh, ADHD was the first one that was more obvious, should we say? More obvious. So, did you have um, that that quite classic ADHD little boy in school disruptive profile? Or you know what? Else? No, um, I, I, I didn't. And I've spoken to people about this since. I wasn't that that little boy. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't naughty. I wasn't disruptive. Um, you know, I was never in the headmaster's office or any of those things, but what I know now is I was never quiet. And, and although I wasn't disruptive in the classroom, I was never still, but for me, it was that my brain was never quiet. So yeah. this never stopped. So because this never stopped, I was constantly talking, constantly asking questions, constantly Sometimes it would come across as quite challenging. Um, didn't really understand my peers. Didn't really relate to them. But what I now understand as an adult was I was just a little bit more comfortable with adults because they could answer my questions, whereas my, my peers couldn't. So I found friendships quite hard. I tried to have friends. I was like the, the, the Labrador puppy, you know? I wanted everyone to be my friend. I would wag my tail at everyone, but I might be, have been included in things, but I was always really on the fringes. I was always very much, um, nobody quite knew what to do with me, should we say? Yeah. Um, I'm, a, really glad. I'm really glad that you've, you've shared that because you absolutely do challenge that, that portrayal. And that's what we're about here at Activate Community with Activate Auditory Connections. We really do want yeah. to challenge those those quite quite simplistic ideas of what ADHD is, what different neurotypes are. So it really does yeah. sound like you were you were dreamy, you were you were creative, you were you were inquisitive, relentlessly inquisitive. And that's led you to the career yeah. that you have now. Tell us a bit more about what you do, Matt. So right now and for the past coming up for two years, um, I've done sort of what was my my career art really. So I now consult and train other businesses, other organizations and help them understand what this thing of neurodiversity awareness is, what, what, what the words mean, what the labels mean and why it's important to them. Um, so because my background pre self-employment was predominantly in hospitality, tourism and leisure, predominantly I spent bits of time in recruitment but it was in those that made industry I was always from the age of 17 when I took my first job uh, up until 35 ish when I went self-employed uh, I was always in a people 
position. I was always, at whatever role, whatever stage of the career, it was always surrounded by people. So I have this perspective that I realized when I started doing this, that I could talk to businesses not just about their organization, their people, their staff, but also about their suppliers, their contractors. And when we talk about the sporting facilities, the clubs, the organizations, I'm able to say, hold on, what about your players? What about your coaches? What about your fans and your visitors? Because all of them potentially are going to be affected in some way by some kind of neurotype, by some kind of neurodivergence. And it's understanding that that's going to be important for you to be an effective business. And I think that's been different for them, really. It's a different approach. I can really picture that that Labrador, the, the picture that you painted for us, growing these wings and, and flying over these different organizations to get yeah, that, yeah. that bigger picture viewpoint. So yeah, yeah. it sounds like your ADHD for you has been this vantage point of seeing things differently. Yeah, but it's one that I didn't understand until I understood my own ADHD and other people's. So I wasn't diagnosed until I was, uh, where was I, just turning 46, just before my 46th birthday. Wow. So 2019, the end of 2019. Um, I'd known I had ADHD. I'd accepted that I had ADHD for about five years before that, because I'd been told at a conference in no uncertain terms. So I knew. Um, and I was quite happy with it, but I hadn't gone down the route of clinical diagnosis at that point because I didn't feel I needed it. But in that preceding five years, it had made sense. I'd kind of been able to say, oh, OK, now some of my my previous work history makes sense. Now some of the, the things I did make sense, not all, but some post diagnosis and since doing this as a career, everything makes sense. I can look at the way that I approached almost every single job in every single career that I had, whether it was a success or not, and attribute in some part what ADHD brought to that that situation, as well as latterly autism, as well as latterly the dyslexia even. So it's been quite fascinating for me to, to look back, but it does give me an overview. It does give me a, it gives me an ability to draw three different areas of experience that I don't often see drawn together properly. Um, so people talk, talk about lived experience, right? A lot. My theory is everyone's got lived experience because we're alive and we've been alive. Whatever you have lived experience of, we all have it. Leveraging that as a, as, a, as a financial tool, okay, I can see where people go with that. Before I even thought about that, I had learned experience from the people I had seen and worked with and taught and advocated for before I knew anything about myself. And that was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And I'd also got this life experience thing. And life experience before any knowledge of, of neurodivergent conditions is really important because without that filter, without that knowledge, it wasn't great. You know, I'd be lying if I said it had all been happy, go lucky and a wonderful ride. It hadn't. It had been difficult. It had been painful. I've been I've had multiple bouts of suicidal ideation. I couldn't understand. I didn't know why. And it's not until I was able to go, well, if I put that layer on top of that layer on top of that layer, this is the picture. This is the complete understanding. Take any one of those layers away and the understanding's not complete and it doesn't make as much sense. But I'm fortunate that I'm able to do that. And I'm fortunate that the gift I, I do have that I'm told by other people rather than me saying it, which is always nice, is that I can communicate it. I speak. I, I stand in front of people, I talk to them, I educate them, and I communicate things in ways that people who maybe necessarily don't have the knowledge or the understanding can then understand. You and they can do something do. with it. You communicate incredibly effectively. And I'd like to say, Matt, I think that you know that. I think sometimes there's that voice in the back of our minds, particularly as ADHDers. We've got that rejection sensitive dysphoria 
we tend to have lower self-esteem than our neurotypical peers. I think it's really okay to take a moment to, to kind of pat ourselves on the back. back or I, I have this ritual where I give myself clicks or a round of applause yeah, every yeah, day yeah. For, for whatever I've achieved. So yeah, I think yeah. you can absolutely say with confidence that, that you are an effective communicator. And oh, it sounds bless. like, no worries at all. It sounds like you really... You really put thought into the message that you want people to receive. You've not just said, I'm an expert by experience. This is what's happening to me. Make of it what you will. But it's actually you've considered from other people's perspective and you've brought them into your world. You've invited them in. You've, you've thought about what you want them to, to achieve and, and then sent them back to their organizations and their businesses. And I think that's really important for for experts by experiences, for, for ND consultants, that we do have that slightly elevated game. You know, we're, we're yeah. fighting for a movement, the neurodiversity movement. We've, we've got to be on it. What, what, yeah. keeps, you, what keeps you on it? Um, short answer, my kids. It's no more than that. I have two teenage sons. They're 16 and just turned 18. Um, and they are the reason that all of this is is happening they're the reason that i do this um and was always going to so they um there's 15 months between them they were both diagnosed at just just four years old with what was asperger's then um and, and they still refer to themselves as having asperger's as the why um and so they were diagnosed with that and then in their sort of mid-teenage years both with uh, with adhd um and they're what drive everything because when they were diagnosed my wife and i did what we assumed every parent did we now understand maybe that's not the case but what we assumed every parent did which is we hyperfixated our special interest became autism our special interest became taking the information we got from clinical diagnosis which wasn't the most positive which wasn't the most you know um empowering for them or for us as parents at the time and saying no wait a minute can we just go and find out everything we can about this and then we'll decide whether we're going to write them off and they won't be able to do x y and z so that's what we did um we threw ourselves headlong into everything we could whether it was books whether it was what was available which wasn't much online at that point whether it was seminars conferences parent forums you name it we did it just to try and hear from other people um and yeah you've really that brought was, us that was into the touch that, paper. Way that autism autism the 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 neurological disease under the medical model and autism the neurological disability with its own culture are two very different things and it sounds like hearing other people's stories becoming part of this culture has has been really significant for your family it yeah it has but what's interesting is what we've learned because my wife works in a college, she she supports teenagers with with learning uh, challenges. So she's a, a learning support advisor. That's what she does. So she's as knowledgeable, if not probably more so than me, I often say. But we know what we know because we've learned it together. What we have since learned is that not everyone is as positive. Not everyone is as what's the word as determined to fight for the equality for the the right for their their children or for themselves to say no wait a minute don't write me off yet um we see an awful lot still unfortunately of parents who use their child's diagnosis of whatever it may be as an excuse you know they can't do this they can't do that they won't do this they won't do that so they're disabling their children before ever giving them a chance, before ever giving that child a chance to shine and say, well, actually, I can do this. Um, and so we've we've become quite passionate about challenging that. We've never said to our children, you can't. We've never said to them, they're not able. And because 
as parents, we have now spent hundreds, thousands of hours on the phone in front of our children, advocating for other parents with newly diagnosed children or who have got new diagnosis themselves, as well as talking to teachers, as well as talking to businesses. They've grown up hearing that. They have grown up having conversations about their autism, about their ADHD, about dyslexia, about everything else. Because why wouldn't we have those conversations around? It is their world. It is their life. And it's important that they know how to understand it and how to speak about it, which they do very eloquently, funnily enough. Um, and so that's the driver. The driver is if, well, if we can have those conversations in our own home, we should have them outside of our own home as well. So when I go out and I talk to people, I talk to them as a parent so I can relate to parents. I talk to them as someone who was a kid once, who was a teenager once, who was a 20 something, a 30 something. Now, I've, you know, I've got this ability to be able to say, I understand you. I understand you at where whatever your stage of knowledge is, whatever your stage of understanding is, I get it. And what I want to do is make you not terrified. I want you to not be confused. I want you to not be distressed about anything that you're hearing. I want you to feel that this is okay and this is why. And if that's the message I spread, then great. Listen, those conversations sound hugely powerful. It sounds like your family, your unit really are this driving force within within yeah. your local community, within the neurodiversity movement itself. So that is an absolute pleasure to hear. What it's making me wonder is the ways in which this has boosted your mental health, having this purpose, having this mission. Has this been a, a stress to your mental health or, or a boost to your mental health? Do you know what? It's been both. Being very, very honest with you, it's been both. So I, I kind of started this process at the beginning of COVID-19 striking around the world. Now, in tandem with that, I was diagnosed with ADHD at, in December of 2019. By February of 2020, I had just just about finished the titration period for medication so i just about settled on a dose of, of methylphenidate and i was supposed to be starting counseling i was supposed to be starting therapy i was supposed to be starting sort of this this clinical understanding process of my own adhd which at that point i didn't really have and then we locked down everything stopped at that point i was still a professional entertainer full time. I hadn't started doing this yet. Um, it was a germ of an idea, but I wasn't there. And so instead of having the time to, you know, understand what was going on and come to terms with things, I had to go into full fight or flight mode. And this is where ADHD is a strength. I went from, okay, well, every single booking for what should have been at that point, the single most financially lucrative year I'd ever had as an entertainer, walked out of the door in 14 days, just gone, cancelled, because they had to. And I suddenly had to, to learn what to do. And, and suddenly I had a studio in the conservatory. I was working online. I was, I was entertaining in the same way I'd done online. That turned then into a corporate world. And it's at that point, so we're talking probably... June or July of 2020, through a chance conversation online, somebody who was in the corporate world, the corporate sort of speaking and, and motivation world, reached out and said, you're different. You don't need to be doing this for kids and families. You need to be doing what you're doing for businesses. So I started reaching out to businesses. And believe it or not, I, I spent most of the year teaching businesses how to juggle as a mindfulness activity. So I, I teach it as a form of active mindfulness. And I taught just under 10,000 people throughout lockdown online to juggle. I've got juggling balls uh, all, all around me here. This, yeah, there's yeah. always something around. Yeah. Got to be done, right? Me too, somewhere. The thing is I taught them. And then as, as I did that, the conversation always went to ADHD because it was new. It was a passion for me at that point. I always mentioned it. And I would tell people, 
you know, they'd, uh, very often people would say, how are you able to teach a hundred of us how to juggle at the same time on Zoom? Well, okay, so ADHD is why I can do that because, and I would, and it would work. Through that, I spoke more about mindfulness. And then I, I turn the computers off and sit there for an hour thinking, this is actually what I want to do. This is what I need to do for my sons. I need more people to understand why certain things are good, why there are certain net positives of ADHD and, and their autism at that time, because I didn't know about mine. So I just started making very small, gradual plans about what I wanted to do. Um, had some help from a, a good friend of mine to, to get an idea of the business name and the, the aim and the intention. And then put myself out on LinkedIn very quietly, very slowly, lurking, listening, watching, seeing who the biggest voices were, seeing if I agreed with what was being said um, or not. And then as I gained mm -hmm. confidence, I'd start to post and I'd start to comment and I'd start to share. And it sort of grew from there over the next 12, 15 months to where it is now. And it's, you know, taking off and working for the, with the NHS and working with the Department of Trade and Industry and Sporting Institutions. And, you know, you are, you're, you're flying so, high. You're Matt got yeah. well on LinkedIn for anyone who does want to reach out. You've got Think Neurodiversity on LinkedIn and you've got some videos there that go share a little bit more about what you're talking about here. Some really strong videos there. It has made me wonder now that I hear that you're dyslexic, if if you use videos as a means to get around that dyslexia, or do you find that you can use LinkedIn quite effectively? Yeah, no, do you know what? I've never realized this. So that coming to the acceptance of dyslexia has been a real long battle for me because, um, and this will sound like a really back to front way of saying this, there's a movement at the moment um, fronted by a particular organization about dyslexic superpowers dyslexia is now a skill on linkedin it is dyslexic right? thinking right now i'm gonna just say this straight out i completely disagree with that i have dyslexia I, that's it I, but i disagree with that as a notion and i disagree with it as a notion because every single example that's given of look at this uber successful person with dyslexia their dyslexic thinking has let them to next y and z every single one has a comorbid condition that's normally autism or adhd as well if not both and what that says to me is it is not singularly dyslexic thinking it's neurodivergent thinking it is the profile of a neurodivergent brain with coexisting conditions that changes the way that person processes information and changes their ability to do. Now, all of the very successful ones have also had an incredible amount of good fortune, an incredible amount of drive, an incredible amount of other things that aren't necessarily neurodivergent based, but that are helped by saying it is solely dyslexic thinking, just I don't I don't agree with, which is why it's not on my LinkedIn profile, it never will be. However, when that first came out, I knew that very often if you had ADHD, dyslexia might be a thing. I knew that if you had autism, dyslexia might be a thing. My sister's dyslexic. That almost certainly, you know, something else as well, but that's for her to say. And I kind of went, mm, do I need to just look into this? So I did the profiling test from the organization that were making the, the noise about dyslexic thinking and i took the test and it came out as dyslexic i asked my wife to do it who is autistic and adhd she came out as dyslexic i asked my sons to do it they came out well actually one of them came out as dyslexic now interestingly my wife coming out as dyslexic is a bit of an oxymoron because we know that she's hyperlexic as is my younger son so that's the counterpoint mm. to dyslexia Right. Yeah. And I sat there and my instant reaction was there, I've proved it. I'm not dyslexic, I'm neurodivergent. The skills, what it says are the deficits and what it says are the positives mirror my ADHD. They mirror my autism. I don't struggle or I didn't think I struggled. I then went away and sat down and thought about it for a long time and thought, Do you know what? I've not read a book in over six years. 
I just can't read books. I find it exhausting. I find it tiring. It causes me stress. I don't enjoy it. I audio book um, because that's the only way I can absorb information. Um, and I started to think about that. My writing's terrible. My written communication's never been great, um, although I'm fairly eloquent. And when I relaxed my my fight a bit, okay, yes, I understand how those are dyslexic things. That the, Those things I find hard are part of dyslexia. So I accept that I have dyslexia and I accept how it affects me but it doesn't define what I'm good at. It's not the reason I am good at X, Y, and Z, if that makes sense. It's a part of, but it's yes. not the particular reason. Does so that's it, why, again, I, I challenge it. It really can seem like this this odd one out within the, the umbrella of, of neurodivergence. I know that... Um, a lot of us who have neurodivergent diagnoses are, are very, very ready to acknowledge that, that we're disabled, whereas dyslexics are more likely to be on the fence and some people consider themselves absolutely disabled by their, their dyslexia and others not at all. The idea of referring to them as dis themselves as disabled seems, seems completely absurd. So there really does seem to be a variety of ways to experience our own neurotypes, ways to experience that dyslexia. So perhaps people do have very different experiences and there may well be some, some defining strengths to dyslexia that, that through our own lived experiences, we've not quite been able to, to pick up on, but that, that others do have. It sounds like dyslexia hasn't been a, a huge barrier for you in 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 business in your life but it is something that you accept has had as a bit of an impact on you yeah and i think that's the key it is part of my profile right it's part of my neurodivergent profile it's part of that makeup i cannot refuse to accept it because it's it's it, it's part obvious yeah but but it's not the be all adhd is not the be all and end all autism pda is not the be all and end all neither is dyslexia but between the three of them they all contribute to making me who i am making me good at the things i'm good at and struggle where i struggle and that's the message that i try to to, to give to people is nothing is as black and white as a so, social media campaign nothing is it can only be dyslexia. Dyslex it's not that. And th that's not helping the wider advocacy piece to say that, in my opinion. No, I'm, I'm willing to be proven wrong. I'm willing for other people to tell me that that's not what they agree with, and that's fine. Because, again, we're individuals. We have our own thought processes, and we have our own experience of these things. My experience my experience of other people that I've supported and worked with and advocated for who are dyslexic and autistic and ADHD and dyspraxic is it's never just one thing ever. It's always a combination. It's always how each of those different conditions mix with each other and, and help and hinder each other. And that's, what I try to get across, um, but you yeah, know, it's, as, it's... as Indias, we we're, we're whole people. We are we are yeah. complete, and we are different within ourselves, and then different within groups, and different yeah. within the bigger whole. That is the nature of diversity. It's been lovely yeah. to hear your thoughts, and um, I would love to. Um, pull you a little bit into the neurodiversity movement. I know that you've, you've talked about your, your, your passion for, for advocacy and that you, you want to challenge the nuances of, or, or challenge the, the lack of nuance in social media campaigns. I know you've got this entertaining background. Is, is that something that you think is going to help you create change? Are you going to be that person that, that brings that nuance that we've been waiting for? 
Right now, do, do you know it's really weird? This is the strangest thing. So, so I, I'm an entertainer. That's what I've always done. I've spoken, I've performed. You know, I, I've been on national TV. I've hosted events with thirty five thousand people on my own. I, you know, talking is my thing. It's my, it's my, my wheelhouse. And I have always, always said that I'm happiest on a stage. I'm happiest speaking to people. I'm happiest helping people through talking to them and through through educating them. Um, and I'm at this point in my my process with, with the consultancy and with the work I'm doing where I'm speaking that bit more and I'm having people who are in the speaking industry professionally who are starting to pay attention, starting to look at me and go, maybe unlike a lot of people who come to speaking through a different career and have to have some sort of coaching or some training or some some help in how to speak i'm different because you could put me on a stage in front of anyone in any audience and i wouldn't bat an eyelid but i'll engage them and i'll motivate them and i'll leave them feeling motivated and, and ready to go and take action now today because that's what I do. I now, love that confidence. It's absolutely yeah. fabulous. So you're going but to use the speaking to, to drive yeah. the change that we need. Because I need, without sounding conceited, and I don't want this to come across as such, some of us are born with certain skills, some of us are not. I know, because of what I've been doing for so long, that the skill that I have is this. I would not have had the success I've had in front of people if I couldn't speak well, if I couldn't present well, if I couldn't communicate well. And the fact that other people are telling me that now is enough for me to say, go do it. I often joke, my wife has said for years, we've been together since we were teenagers. And she says this to me uh, very frequently when we talk about this. I don't know if you, uh, you, you'll know Tony Robbins, right? He's world famous. Yes, uh, motivational yes. speaker. My wife has said to me for over a decade, why aren't you the Tony Robbins of neurodiversity? What's, what's <laughs> gone wrong? Why are what's you gone not? wrong? I'm sure Tony what? Robbins would say it to put that a little bit more positively. Right, he would well, say, I'm ah, the Tony Robbins of the ND movement. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. And look, there's a many. But my thing is, you know what? I'm at the point now where I'm sat here thinking, you know what? She's right. She's right. Give me the stage and I'll do the rest. Give me the audience. I will do the rest. You know, and, and so that's the mission. The mission for me is take the positivity that I have, take the, the, the ability that I have and take the knowledge that I know that I have now, that I've accepted that I have, and just give me the stage to share it with people. Sounds That's what needs to happen. Fantastic. So your ADHD, your lived experience, your passion, it drives you onto that stage. You use the word rest then, so I'll do the rest. Is that your PDA? Is that the pathological demand avoidance that then takes you to have a little rest afterwards? Oh, no, yeah, no, do you know what? No, bizarrely, the rest part for me is when I come off stage, I'm catatonic for a few hours. I don't speak, I don't move, I just lie on my bed and you know, I have to. That's the that's the autism. The, the, the PDA side for me in all of this is very much I am I am challenging. I am divisive, and I know I am. I do say the things that other people don't say. And and I understand that's my PDA because I, I use the phrase a lot. I'm willing to to say this until someone proves me wrong. Does that make sense? Challenge me. I will challenge you. I will challenge anything that I see that I don't think is right, that I don't think is is done well. But prove me wrong. And if you prove me wrong, and I can I can accept the proof, I'll take it. That's my PDA. The you ADHD side. Of it. it sounds like you, you do. really got this. Um... It's quite a positive relationship with with PDA that can sometimes get the 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 brunt of the the stigmas and and the the negative self talk. So it's really refreshing to hear PDA talked about so positively. I think what I'm learning, and it's taking a while, but what I'm learning is when I was younger, my PDA is what caused me an awful lot of problems. 
Being, I used to say I was sacked from the jobs I was sat from because of ADHD. That's not true. I was sat because my ADHD was spiraling, but my PDA, which, you know, you, people talk about the, uh, the inner chimp, right? PDA is my inner chimp. And that chimp is 300 pounds, packed full of muscle with pointy teeth, sharp claws, and is in a really foul mood. That's oh my, my chimp. Goodness. Right. That's that's what my chimp looks like. That's what it sounds like. The thing is, if I let that chimp be, it's really destructive, really destructive because it won't listen. It won't let me take advice. It won't let me believe anything. Right. It won't let me try new things. And it's horrible. If I give it the right amount of bananas, the right amount of sleep the right amount of everything it just kind of lies there in the background going every now and again i'll just get a claw on the shoulder that says are you sure you don't want to check that are you sure you don't want to challenge that i'm not saying you have to just are you sure now that's a bit kinder to me that's a bit more of a it allows me to say things you know it's why i make hundreds of social media posts every week and post only a handful of them because a lot of them are me venting the inner chimp and then deleting it because it'll never be seen in public, right? But I learn, I've learned that. What the ADHD does for me in this ability and in this work is I can think at a billion miles an hour. I can, I can be on stage and have a microphone die and it makes no difference because I can project, you know, I, I, I was once told my voice was louder than a jumbo jet crashing. I have it tested. It was true. Right. So I know that if things go wrong, I can carry on. I can cope. I can override it. I can still get the job done. That's the difference with me. I'm I'm. I'm unflappable in the face of things that would make most people just fall apart. Well, you use I, hugely. Um pictureful pictureful language i love the way you illustrate with words you've got such a positive outlook and you use the word learned there i'm really wondering what things were like before that positivity was learned take me back to when the chimp was in control i know that you've got quite an extensive history when it comes to mental health are you happy to share a little bit about yeah that? yeah okay i'm, I'm gonna try and summarize so when I didn't know anything, so before I was 39, when I, when I really didn't know stuff, um, I went through a career, to call it that, from the age of 17 and a half, 18, uh, up until 35, I think-ish. Um, and as I said, it was mostly hospitality, tourism and leisure. Now, I fell into that because I literally didn't know what to do with my life. I had no idea. All I knew was that I could hold a conversation and, you know, again, this sounds a really strange thing to say. I was I was quite a, a pretty boy. I was quite a handsome young man. I was commun communicative. I could talk. I was sort of destined to work in customer service because I had the, the physical attributes to do that, right? So I started in restaurants. I started at 18. I was a trainee sommelier in a five-star restaurant. Within months, I'd met the great and good of the, the, the world, celebrities, politicians, every famous person I'd ever revered had come through the doors of my restaurant, it seemed. And I learned very quickly some skills that I think are vital. So fame doesn't interest me. Fame doesn't bother me. I don't care how famous you are, rich you are, powerful you are. You're a person. You have expectations of how to be treated, as do I. And I was confident enough to challenge people who, who you know, challenge me. Um, that led me to a career with British Airways for five years because, again, typical ADHD. I saw an advert in a paper. It said, how many languages can you smile in? At the time, I said three to myself. And as I walked to my job in the restaurant, picked up the phone, sent an application form, completely gamed the interview, by which I mean I had insider information about the structure of the interview. I knew exactly what to expect when I went. I knew exactly how to dress, how to speak. I knew where all of the plants in the room were, who were the BA staff pretending to be other interviewees. So I knew to go and speak to them. All of these things 
which meant that at 21 years old, I was at the time the youngest ever member of cabin crew to be um, employed by British Airways as a, as a man. Um, and I, I, I remember t- a year after I joined, I did a flight with the two people that interviewed me, a, a man and a, a lady who interviewed me. And they took me aside in a bar and said, we've never got over that interview. Your interview was the single most confident interview we've ever seen from anyone of any age, but it didn't add up. And at that point, I said, well, I might have had a little bit of insider help. But I was also an outrageous flirt. I'd already at 21 studied some body language and some basic NLP, right? So I was mirroring. I was doing all the things that at 21 I had no right to know, but ADHD, I kind of figured it out. You were in your element. Yeah, right. So they couldn't not give me the job. I spent five years flying around the world. I nearly killed myself several times through drink. I was a borderline alcoholic because I had no filter. I wrapped up, I think my wife's told me, £27,500 worth of debt, which was all drink, because I had a charge card, which I didn't understand the concept of. I didn't understand that when I went to a hotel in... Los Angeles and took out $300 to go and spend on food and drink. I had to pay for it when I came home because I didn't have that ability. I did. I just didn't know that. So I ended up putting all sorts of pressure, went from British Airways to a 10 year wilderness. Part of that, I ended up in, in working in Warwick Castle, managing departments in Warwick Castle, where on um, certain things I excelled in other things, I was a disaster. I just jumped and I jumped and I jumped, always going back within customer service, always in these things where I could either shine or fall apart. Whenever the monkey, whenever the chimp got frustrated, I'd just engineer my own exit. So I was regularly sacked at my doing. It was never the choice of the employer. Oh, massively. But I made sure it happened on my terms. It was me. And I knew it was, and I know I played it. Oh, it wasn't me. I didn't know, but I knew exactly most of the time what I was doing because I'd got frustrated and didn't know how to verbalize that. Which got to 2009, you know, sat from another job in sales that I, I kind of hated. Um, and f- I kind of fell back into entertainment, which is something I'd always done on the side, um, but fell back into entertainment. And yet throughout all of that career history and in self-employment, that inner doubt, that rejection, sensitive dysphoria, that that feeling like I didn't fit in, that feeling like something wasn't right, regularly just made me feel empty. I could stand on stages. I could be in front of hundreds and thousands of people getting so much love and attention and people telling me it was great and just feel bereft. Um, By the time I'd had my kids, by the time I was married and we were in so much sort of financial problems and work problems, I just, I began to realise something probably wasn't right, but I didn't know why. And at that point, when you don't know why, you just say, it's just you, you're just useless, you're just awful. So I've had multiple bouts of suicidal ideation. I've had multiple bouts of just thinking it's not worth it. I've fortunately, I always say this, fortunately, I would never carry through with it because I've always had my children in my mind and said, I can't do that to them. What example am I setting to them if I say I'm finding this tough and I give in? But I've wanted to. Does that make sense? This this protective factor of of having having this family unit. Yeah give that that thought to challenge that suicidal ideation when that comes up oh, yeah 100 percent. has has, um, has circus skills has entertaining boosted your mental health as somebody who i've been sitting back and just absolutely resonating with what you're saying i the way you train your chimp i've been training my voices to as mm. you say be a little bit kinder and the way that you you know you've taken control of those those harmful those destructive behaviors of of drinking of spending and of of isolating and self-destructing in periods of frustration rather than utilizing networks and skills 
So yeah. how much has entertaining um, and the, the circus skills helped you there? Do you know, interestingly, I didn't realise how much until I was coming to the end of doing it. Until, in fact, until I was doing it in COVID. But so entertaining was my happy place. I always knew that when I was entertaining, I was happy. I was fulfilled. I felt like I had a purpose um, for most of the time. Whenever I stopped, the voices would come in. And I feel like this isn't a real job. What am I doing? I'm messing around. But then once I started, whatever the performance was, it was great again. The difference was when I started teaching circus skills and I started my own circus skills business and and I was teaching schools and businesses and all sorts. I, I developed my way of teaching people to juggle, particularly three balls that used, at the time, I kind of knew it, I kind of didn't, but he, he used autistic language, autistic thinking, and I didn't know how much at the time, but it was definitely tapping into my auti- uh, my ADHD skill set as well. Once I, I figured that system out, <coughs> bless you, I, went, I, that's right, I went from, you know, if you put me in a room with 100 people, when I started, I might have taught two or three people to juggle. Because I was trying to teach them to juggle the way every textbook had told me and every other instructor had taught me, following the same process, using the same language. The minute I did it my way and I tested the model and I did it my way, put me in a room of 100 people, 90 of them would learn to juggle. And that only got more and it got more and it got more to the point where I regularly said in 14 years, I taught 80,000 people to juggle on my own. 10,000 you live in alignment with your beliefs. <coughs> so the more you live in alignment with your beliefs, with your neurotype, the more you can achieve. It sounds like you're absolutely living testimony to that. Yeah, but it takes some understanding. There was a point where I didn't know why it worked. It just did. When I had to start explaining it, that's when I really started to understand it. That's when I really started to get it. Um, and so the more I was able to understand it, the more it's fed into what I do now. Because again, and I, I often say this, I am very aware that no one in what I'm doing now has my experience of doing these things. No one's lived my life. No one's been through the things I've been through in the same way. But the difference is, it took me a long time to appreciate how when I spent all that time teaching, I was learning about neurodiversity because I was regularly working for for schools that that supported kids with additional needs. I was regularly working with adults with additional needs. I was regularly doing sort of home education groups where there are hundreds of kids with additional needs, right? I was surrounded, before I was even thinking about me, I was surrounded by neurodiversity. And it meant I had to learn fast. I had to understand when the kids said they were dyspraxic, what did that mean? When they said they were dyslexic, what did it mean? When they said they had ADHD or autism or anything else, what did it mean? How did I have to adapt? And how could I still help them succeed? Now, I got incredibly effective at that, ridiculously effective, because I would listen, because I would learn. You can't learn what I learn about neurodivergent conditions in a textbook. You cannot understand how people verbalize or demonstrate their deficits, their difficulties to you without words until you experience it. And because of that, when I talk about this stuff, I see it from a completely different perspective. I see it from a way that I don't think many people will ever experience. And yet, it's not one that you would ever really think would work, but it does. So circus skills has been and will always be really, really, really important to me. Because I now know why I learned to juggle. I now know why I obsessed on learning to juggle myself. I know why I was never the best juggler but I became an exceptional teacher. Somebody once said to me, and it's the, the, the nicest backhanded compliment in the world. And I was at a massive circus skills festival a couple of years ago. And there was a, a, 
a lady there who'd been coming to a club I was running at the time, a, a unicycling club, teaching people to unicycle, because I did that as well in the spare time. And she just bought her new girlfriend who was about to learn to ride a unicycle. And and and, and the girl that I'd, I'd been teaching was already better than me. She could ride a unicycle better than me, but I'd been able to tweak her riding ability. I couldn't do what she could do, but I was able to see and help. And she said, this guy is weird. And I go, oh, <laughs> nice, nice to see you as well. She said, no, in the nicest way, she said, I've never known anyone who lacks the ability to do the things that they can teach so well. She said, and I mean that in the nicest way, she said, I've never known anyone that could teach literally anything to anybody other than you. And do you that know what? Sounds, she's she's like, right. <laughs> you've had this hugely positive reception from people that you've really juggled, juggled all your ideas. And there they are. There are the juggling balls. You've juggled all of your ideas and your passions. You've used that, that ADHD mind juggled there. You've used those autistic um search for knowledge hunger for knowledge to to learn how to train to learn the people who you're you're so passionate about communicating with that that pda to drive you that dyslexia to drive you and to build that that training consultancy and advocacy career following a very very busy busy period of of different different work Oh yeah, it's been it's been huge. If you could look, you you couldn't have told me three years ago, let alone longer, when I was working as a professional medieval jester, when my job was teaching juggling, walking on stilts, breathing fire, performing escapology, all the crazy things I did. You could not have told me that what I was learning then was how to teach people about neurodiversity. You, you, you would not have been able to help me understand that. And yet I can sit here now in my studio every day and think everything I learned, everything I did there was the single best education I could have had in order to say I can help. Now you will never ever hear me say online that I'm an expert. You will never hear me say that I'm so knowledgeable that I could write the book, I could run the course, I could, because I think that's, I just don't think it's right. Okay, there are people that are right to do that and there are people that aren't. But what I can do is exactly what my friend that rides the unicycle said. I can teach people about things in a way that they can understand and in a way that they can then process in their world. And, if and there are not many people plans, that can. If if they are ready to reach out for some for some training, for some workshops, where can they reach you? Where is the best place to get hold of Matt? So uh, Think Neurodiversity. If, if people just type that into the search engine, so it's at Think Neurodiversity on, um, on LinkedIn is the page or Matt Guffwell on LinkedIn is the best route. Um, thinkneurodiversity.com is the website. Uh, and I, I think I'm on Instagram, although I don't post there. Twitter is a dark art, so I'm afraid to anyone that likes Twitter, you won't find me there because I don't know what to do with it. Uh, but LinkedIn is the best place to find me. That's where you'll see me posting on either my personal page or my, my uh, business page. Um, so, yeah, I, I would suggest there. Reach out to me there. Uh, I'm always open to people just sending me a message and asking a question or, or you know, posting a comment on anything I post. Uh, I, I kind of relish it. I relish the conversations being started. Um, and I think they're useful. The more conversations we have, the more helpful it is, isn't it? Sounds fabulous. Well, thank you very much for talking to me, Matt. Is there anything you want to share before we close now? Yeah, I'll share this and I say it a lot. If people follow me, if people go away and look at me, they'll see me talk about this. So very briefly. I'm passionate about people being passionate. I'm passionate about anyone at any stage of their own understanding of their own neurotype being passionate to educate others. But I am more passionate and I think it's more important that the people that do that 
have the depth and breadth of knowledge to do that properly before they position themselves doing that. So what I mean is I'm fortunate that I'm nearly 50. I have almost 50 years of lived experience of life experience. I have my own lived experiences pre and post diagnosis, but I have learned from tens of thousands of people with neurodivergent conditions, including my own children, including others. And I take that knowledge and I'm able to share it. And I think it's really important that people take the time to study and learn in whatever way they can before they try and advise others so that the information people are giving is actually up to date. It's really experienced and that it's not just their own experience. I rarely talk about my own experiences as being the be all and end all. What I experience is me. I talk about everyone else's experience that they've been kind enough to share with me that I can then package into understanding. So just absorb, learn, grow, then do the rest of it. The balance of passion and strategy, passion and intelligence. That sounds like fantastic closing remarks. It's been a, a pleasure to have you. You've overcome so much and you've, you've, built such a, a fantastic life for yourself and your family. And um, I'm really looking forward to what you bring to the neurodiversity movement. Oh, thank I've you. been Emerald Grace. This has been Matt Gupwell on Activate Auditory Connections. Visit Activate Community CIC and I'll see you soon. So and I never I never stop recording. I always do those those closing credits. Do you want to do something yeah, silly? No, I would. Or the closing <laughs> credits? <laughs> That's great. It's great. Thank you. It was grand. <laughs> With it, with the news reporters shuffling, shuffling, uh, uh, having that, uh, that drink. I know, right? I know. Yeah, I, <laughs> I always watch. I always watch the professionals on the uh, on TV and things, and get really jealous that they have a team of people around them doing everything. I know. <laughs> I know. It's not fair. It's not fair. But you know, that's that, that. That's why I have my own things to change camera angles, and you know, I get. You I do. Get very... Every time it changed, I thought, "How is he doing that? I'm going to get myself one of them." Yeah, I'm gonna let's 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 hit the button at the same time. I'll I'll press stuff on the screen and um and you can it, press stuff on the button. It, it's got a screen. It's got a, a a stream deck is what you need. It will change your world. Sounds fantastic. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna land this thing. <laughs> <laughs>